أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والحمد لله الذي جعلنا من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين ولئمة المعصومين عليهم السلام والحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين خاتم النبيين شفيع المذنبين حبيب الله العالمين بالقاسم مصطفى محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين من يوم عداوتهم إلى يوم الدين أما بعد فقد قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الحكيم وهو أصدق القائلين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الذين آمنوا وتطمئن قلوبهم بذكر الله ألا بذكر الله تطمئن القلوب آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى There is no doubt that it's due to his kindness and generosity that he provides for us opportunities such as these where we gather in remembrance of him tabaraka wa ta'ala next we send our condolences to our 12th and living imam imam al hujja ajal allah ta'ala farajahu sharif allahumma salli ala muhammad and to each and every one of you as we gather in commemoration of the istishhad anniversary of Aba Abdullah al Hussein and his companions and his family alayhim afdalu salatu was salam. Yesterday we began our discussion on the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, dhikrullah. As we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu dhikrullah dhikran kathira. O you who believe, remember God with the frequent remembrance. Um, because there is benefit in remembering God. And then we discussed yesterday in particular that when we talk about the remembrance of God, it's not the, the taking out of dhikr on the tasbih, for example, the alhamdulillah, the subhanallah, alhamdulillah. Though our imams say that this is part of dhikrullah, but this is not what is intended by God when he says remember him frequently. The remembrance of God in a frequent manner is made of two... Uh, foundations or two components. The first is ma'rifatullah, the awareness of God, knowledge of God, because how can we remember one we don't know? So the first component is the remembrance of remembrance of God is ma'rifatullah. The second component which is then which then comes naturally, you can say, from ma'rifatullah is ta'atillah, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is these two components of the knowledge of God or awareness of God and the obedience of God in every single matter or every single facet of our life which together forms dhikrullah. Yeah? Therefore, if we, for example, in every aspect of our life wonder and ask ourselves, would God be proud of me if I'm doing this? If a thought crosses my mind, though we don't get punished for thoughts, there is definitely a spiritual imprint that it leaves in our minds. Yeah? Oftentimes we think that, well, if I'm thinking something and I'm not doing it, it's okay. Maybe from a very materialistic or a physical aspect, yes, it may be okay. But there is no doubt that the spiritual imprint that it leaves in your heart and in your soul can be a corruptive influence in the future. But when I'm thinking something that I should not be thinking about, I ask myself at that time, would God be proud of me? that I'm thinking in this way. And for the hearts which want to connect to God, just that thought alone would be preventative enough for us to stop what we're doing. Yeah? It would be. It should be. Yeah? If I'm doing something where I know is shady, yeah? if I don't think about that at that moment, I may continue in that action. But if I think about at that very moment, is God going to be pleased with me? 
I would stop whatever it is that I'm doing because it is a natural thing to do, isn't it? Yeah? When we're afraid of being caught, we stop. So this is something that makes up together the dhikrullah or the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then we concluded yesterday with the fact that it is the continuous and constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which brings our heart into a state of rest. Yeah? It brings our heart into a state of contentment. And this is why the verse of the Quran says, Allah bi dhikrillah tatma'innul qulub. It is only by the remembrance of God that you will find contentment in your heart. You will find rest in your heart. Yeah? And this is what we explained yesterday is that though when we picture the tragedy of Karbala to be a day um, like no other day, of course it wasn't. Yeah? There were f children being martyred, there were children crying for water. Yet if we had the ability to perceive into their hearts, their hearts would be at rest. Yeah? Their hearts would be at peace with what was happening, which is why even God, when He addresses Aba Abdullah in that final moments, what does He say? Ya ayyatuhan nafsul mutma'inna. Yeah? Oh, that soul which is at rest, Yani Hussein, the world may think that you are going through a lot of difficulty, but I perceive in you, O oh Hussein, that your heart is ready to come to me. Yeah? This is the outcome of a heart which finds rest in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For us, we're not going to go through what Aba Abdullah alayhi salam did. Yet, in our little ups and downs of life, yeah? If we have found that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not matter what life throws our way because we will be in a state of rest and a state of ease. So this is how um, beneficial it can be to be in that constant remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Today we want to discuss two things. We want to discuss first the different stages and the levels of zikr, yeah? of remembrance. In remembrance itself, there are three different stages. Obviously, we start from the first, we go to the third. We can't jump steps. Yeah? Like anything um, in life, when you're climbing a ladder, you climb step by step, isn't it? Yeah? Um, the same thing applies when it comes to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then afterwards, inshallah, we will discuss that which prevents us from remembering God often. Yeah. Um, there are many things that would prevent me from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as frequently as He would like me to remember Him. So these are inshallah the two things that we will discuss today. As far as the steps or the stages of zikr, the first stage or the first level of zikr is what's known as a zikrul lafzi. Yeah? Lafzi, the zikr of lafz is basically talking about the verbalization of zikr, that which we normally consider to be zikr. Yeah? When we say subhanallah, walhamdulillah, these are azkar, these are the remembrances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, but this is in fact the lowest level of remembrance of God. And this can be just loosely translated as the remembrance of the tongue. Yeah? What that means is that we recite the names of God. Yeah? I recite Salah with my tongue. I may do Tasbih after Salah with my tongue. Yet, I am not fully pondering or aware of what I am reciting. Yeah? In other words, I come for Salah, I say Takbiratul Ihram, my mind then begins to wander somewhere else. Before I know it, I'm doing Salam. I finish Salah. Yeah? In other words, so we have recited, we have remembered God, yeah? kinda, yeah? but we have remembered Him through our tongue. Our minds may have been somewhere else, but I have at least remembered Him with my tongue. After Salah, I will take out Tasbih, I will hold a Tasbih in my hand, yeah? but my mind will be somewhere else. Oftentimes, see, ask yourselves, right? how many times we'll hear a text message go off during Salah, and as soon as Salah is done, I'll pick up my Tasbih, but I'll start reading my text at the same time. Yeah? I'll start browsing Facebook at the same time. Yeah? I'll start doing other things on my phone at the same time. But my hand, subhanAllah, has a tasbih, Allah. Yeah? I have a remembrance of you in my hand. Yeah? This is that lowest level of remembrance of God, where my tongue is moving, but that's all there is. Yeah? There is no connection anywhere else with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
even though if we look at and examine this lowest level, we may, uh, we may say that, well, this is not really remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is it? But still our ulama consider this to be the lowest level of remembrance for two reasons. One is because we cannot move to the second stage of remembrance without the first stage of remembrance. Yeah? The second more spiritual stage still requires me to remember God with my tongue. So the remembrance of the tongue is the entryway and that first remembrance to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is a prelude basically yeah, to the second stage of remembrance. The second reason why is even though I, my mind may be somewhere else, it's not completely devoid of remembrance. The reason being is that if I, for example, am in salah, if some were to ask, someone were to ask me, what are you doing? I can tell them, even though my mind is somewhere else, I'd be able to say I'm praying to God. Yeah? Isn't it? Yeah? So by fact that even if, for example, I pray maghrib, and for two-thirds of salatul maghrib, my mind is somewhere else, did I fulfill my duty in front of God? Yeah, I did. Yeah, there's a check mark by Maghrib. It may not escalate or elevate me, but there is a check mark by Maghrib. So by doing that, I have fulfilled that basic criteria of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the lowest level. This is nothing to be proud about. Yeah, this level. And this level is something we learn as children. And I truly believe in my heart that none of us are on this level anymore. We have, ex we have raised our game basically in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second level, is what is known as a zikrul ma'ani or zikrul ma'nawi. What this means um, in a loose translation would be that I understand the meaning of that which I am reciting. Yeah. So when I am reciting Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, in my mind I am imagining that there is nothing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is nothing greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When I am reciting Alhamdulillah, I am literally remembering the graces of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as I'm reciting. Yeah? You know, this means that it's not just a quick tasbih. You know, we, can, um, I rem we recite tasbih very fast after salah. Alhamdulillah, 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 alhamdulillah. Yeah? It may not even qualify for the first because we don't really know what we're saying. Yeah? But we recite it in a manner just to get, get it done. I remember, to be quite honest, some of my teachers were just profound. You know, they were amazing people. I remember my teacher's tasbih would take longer or as long as his Salatul Maghrib sometimes. Yeah? Because he would be pondering each bead, each, ta each zikr. He would be remembering certain things. He will be remembering the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon him. This is that second station where when I'm reciting salah, I understand what I am reciting. My brothers and sisters, I hope this is not the case and inshallah it is not. The minimum expectation from us, you know God in the Quran has never said pray. Yeah? Salli. He's never said that when it comes to salah. He's always said aqimus salah. Yeah? Establish Salah. There's a big difference between reciting Salah and establishing Salah. Establishing Salah means that my life revolves around Salah. Yeah? Everything revolves around Salah. Not that Salah revolves around my time. Yeah? You know people, in other words, if you, if you want to go watch a movie for example, you'll adjust your movie schedule according to the time of Salah. You won't adjust your Salah in accordance to the time of the movie. You know what I mean? And this happens in all facets of life. The establishment of Salah, one of the main principles of it is that we should know what we are reciting in Salah. Yeah? It is a shame. It is a shame that we can become 40, 50, 60 and yet have no idea what we are reciting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Salah. It's a shame. How can it not be a shame that I'm communicating to God and I have no idea what I'm saying to God? Yeah? How can that be? Right? Imagine if we had conversations with regular people like that where I don't know what I'm saying but I'm just talking. Yeah? I know it's right because it's there in the dictionary but I don't know what it means. It wouldn't work with anybody else but we try to throw it off with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So at the very minimum, the respectation from us is that at least when we are reciting Salah, I should be able to know that when I say, for example, Subhana Rabbi Al-A'la wa bihamdi, 
What that means, yeah, that I'm promising or I'm saying to God, attesting to God, that as I am in my lowest station, Ya Allah, you are the one who is most high. Yeah? We should be able to have that connection with us in salah. So this is just a general, this is just a simple example, but this is something which is the, is the, is the overarching understanding of this second level, is that I understand what I'm reciting. And I reflect over it when I am reciting. You know, the, one of the good ways of maintaining our concentration in salah, especially if one who's not an Arab speaker, is to translate what we're doing in our head at the same time. That will keep your attention in salah. Yeah? So when you're reciting Surah Al-Hamd, in your mind you understand that you are saying, God guide me on this right path, the path of those whom you have blessed, not the path of... The so you're reciting this in your head, though your tongue is moving in Arabic. Yeah? But the understanding is happening. In this way, you won't lose focus of what you're doing in salah. Right? So this is that second station of, of zikr, where I know what I am reciting, not just know, I am concentrating on the meaning of that of which I am reciting. And this, there is no doubt, will have a huge impact in our life. Yeah? The spiritual... Um, imprint that this will leave in our life, we will actually begin to see the benefits of the azkar that we recite, of the, of the names of God that we recite. You know, there's two names that were taught to me or that I learned in my period of Hawza which have had a huge impact in my life. Um, because I've been reciting these two adhkar, I always share it with the people because it's had a huge impact in my life. Now, whether or not I'd be where I am without this adhkar, I don't. So the fact that I am here with this adhkar, I give the credit to, the, to those adhkar, isn't it? Yeah? This is a simple and logical thing to do, isn't it? So one thing that is really beneficial is that after Salatul Fajr, you put your hand on your chest and you recite Ya Fattah 70 times. Ya Fattah, 70 times while your hand is on your chest. Fattah means the one who opens, the opener. So what we're asking God is to open my heart to allow His nur to come in, to allow His guidance to come in, to allow His knowledge to come in. Yeah? Don't leave this, please. Yeah? Don't leave this dhikr. The second is in the final sajda that we do, yeah? The sajda is shukr as we do after salah. Recite in that Ya Wahhab 14 times. Yeah? Ya Wahhab 14 times. This as well, Wahhab is what? The giver, isn't it? Yeah? The one who gifts. So we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that final sajda to gift me. Now I'm not asking him what I want as a gift. I will ask and take whatever he has to give me as a gift. Yeah. So these two adhkar have been very influential in my life and inshallah it can benefit you as well. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Ala Muhammad. The third level or the third stage of remembrance of God is what is known as a zikrul qalbi. Yeah. This is where it is the remembrance of the heart. Yeah? The remembrance of the heart is the highest stage of remembrance where one feels the presence of God in their heart. When one recognizes the grandeur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their heart. This is different than the second stage. Yeah? The second stage is where I concentrate on the meaning and the words of what I am reciting. Like in salah, tasbih, during the amal. But this third stage of remembrance I feel the beauty of God in my heart. I feel the, the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in my heart. And this, this feeling that I get in remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will automatically transfer from my heart to my tongue and a zikr will come out from my mouth. Yeah? So when I see something beautiful and my heart recognizes that that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation, right away that will create subhanallah from my mouth. That will create mashaAllah from my mouth. That will create Allahu Akbar from my mouth. You know, the first time you see the Kaaba, for example. 
Yeah? You say Allahu Akbar. That is an example of a zikrul qalbi. That which began in your heart because you recognized the grandeur of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it automatically created a zikr that came out of our mouth. Whenever a zikr starts in this way, this is known as zikrul qalbi. Yeah? We see examples of this on the Holy Quran. For example, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam, and then when the angels saw the greatness of the creation of Adam, what did they say? Qalu subhanaka la ilma lana illa ma allamtana. Their first reaction when they saw the greatness of the creation of God was subhanaka. Glory be to you, O Allah. Yeah? This is that result of a zikr which emanates from the heart. We see this, this happens to us sometimes, you know. I feel that we, um, we go back and forth between the second and the third stage. I hope that we're not in the first stage. So a lot of times we are in the first stage. The first stage for us at our stage in our lives often happens because either I didn't sleep enough, um, I ate too much, so my concentration is not there. Um, a lot of things are happening in my life, so my concentration is not there. But when we find the right moment of concentration, this is where, inshallah, most of us are, in that second level where we're understanding what we're reciting. Every once in a while, we will dip into the third stage. And when we dip into that third stage, you feel God. Yeah? You feel the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I know for a fact we've all experienced this. Yeah? When, for example, you see the changes of color in the fall, wasn't the first reaction, subhanallah, look at the creation of God. Yeah? When you see the trees bringing back the leaves, isn't the first reaction, subhanallah, look at the creation of God. When you go drive here, what is it, Jasper here? Isn't that the first reaction you say, subhanallah, look at the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It happens to us sometimes. It doesn't just have to be sometimes. The problem is, is that we tend to look for miracles. What we forget is that every single day in our life there is a miracle. Yeah? The fact that I am breathing is a miracle. The fact that I am alive is a miracle. The fact that I see you coming in all these distances, driving in cars so fast and the chance of act. Oh, but we're still here. Subhanallah. Yeah? Alhamdulillah. Yeah? We feel these sometimes. You know, sometimes it's stronger than others. I'll give you one or two examples from my own life when, when it shakes you. And I'm sure if by giving these examples you'll know um, what I mean, and you'll be able to find similar examples in your life. Not too long ago, I was applying for my immigration paperwork, yeah, um, to, to live here permanently. And I filled out the paperwork. This is a very personal story, yeah, don't go share it with anybody. Um, so I'm filling out this paperwork of my immigration, and it's all done. The last thing left to do is for me to go take passport photos, yeah. So... I go, I go to Walmart, yeah? First of all, she charged me 25 bucks. I was like, are you kidding? Yeah? But I said, okay, fine, yeah, $25, no big deal. So I, I was in a rush. I said, I need this quickly. So she took the picture, and then she says, it'll be ready. So I went around, and I looked around, and I came back when she told me 15 minutes later, the girl had gone to lunch and just forgotten my order, yeah? So I was like, you know what? I don't have time to wait for this, right? So I left. And then I drove, I checked on my phone, I said, okay, there's another passport place this way. I went there, this was a Tuesday, yeah? I drove to that place, that business was closed, yeah? They said, we close on Tuesdays. I was like, subhanallah, who closes on a Tuesday, <laughs> yeah? Who closes on a Tuesday, right? If it was Monday, I'd be like, he's an Indian, yeah? But it wasn't closed on a Monday, it was a Tuesday. And by this time, I said, you know what, I'm running late. Yeah? So I said, I'll drive, I'll drive to work, but if there's something on the way, I'll stop. I drove, you know, you're looking around, got me a headache, looking back and forth. I didn't find anything, so I said, khair, I'll go the next day. That night, I was talking to one of my friends on the phone, and he asked me, what are you doing? And I told him, and he said, you know, you filled this paperwork wrong. Yeah? If you had sent it the way you had sent it, it would have delayed your application by nine months. Just change one application and it will happen nine months faster. You know what I said? Subhanallah. Yeah? Subhanallah. Who closes on a Tuesday? For real? Yeah? 
I ask myself that, yeah? Look at God. When He wants something to happen, look at the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was a living miracle. Things like this happen in our lives all the time for God to show us, hey buddy, I'm right here. I'm right here. Yeah? Imagine my brothers and sisters, if we fulfilled our responsibility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and actually embodied the attributes of God and became God-like in our lives, whenever I would see you, I would say subhanallah. Yeah? Whenever you would see me, you would say subhanallah. Why? Because we would be and are living embodiments of the miracle of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? That is what God wants. Yeah? That is how that emanates from our heart, where it comes from the bottom of our heart, yeah? and it comes out onto our tongue. This is that third station of zikrul qalbi. Yeah? Where, how do we reach that? Yeah? Like what we discussed yesterday, this is reached through ma'rifa and ta'atullah. Yeah? This third station is reached through the awareness of God. The more I become aware of God, the more I will see God everywhere. I will see the actions of God everywhere. I will see the miracles of God everywhere. And the more that I submit to the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more I will reflect myself the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? But unfortunately, unfortunately, we in our lives um, have created such obstacles yeah, that we are trapped oftentimes just in that first stage of zikr. Yeah. Because of certain challenges and obstacles in life, um, oftentimes brought, around by, brought, brought about by ourselves. Yeah. God, of course, has put tests out there. Yeah. Oftentimes we end up picking and choosing our own exams. Yeah. And because of these tests, we fail to even pass the first level of zikr, yeah? of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now we're going to relate a few hurdles, just three inshallah. There's a lot of hurdles that we can discuss. But when we talk about the hurdles, um, the hurdles to the remembrance of God, and if we were to relate them to the stages of remembrance, these hurdles don't apply to the first stage of remembrance. Yeah? The first stage of remembrance is just moving the tongue. Um, we'll do that all the time, isn't it? Yeah? We'll pray to God even though we have all these hurdles in our life, we'll still pray to God. So the first stage of hurdle or the first stage of remembrance is not really bothered by any hurdle except really of, of pure disbelief. Yeah? Where I don't believe in God anymore, so I'm not even going to remember Him. Yeah? It's not worth my time to remember him. This is that first stage. This is the hurdle of the first stage. All the hurdles that we're going to talk about are those that affect our second and third stages of remembrances of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are you all with me? Yeah? Salwa ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The first stage or the first hurdle that will make me forget the remembrance of God is what is known as hubbud dunya yeah? love of this world yeah? the, the attraction of this world the desires of this world are going to lead me away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala especially if I follow them yeah? if I let them lead me right? um, we'll discuss the third the third one has a connection with this a little bit but the, the love of this world and the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot simultaneously exist at the same time. It's impossible. Yeah? I can, my, my love of this world, if it is a byproduct of my love for God, then it is fine. Yeah? So I love, for example, my family. I love earning or going out and earning money, but it is because of my love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has described for me my responsibilities of looking after my family and the rest of creation. Therefore, I go earn money. I love to do that, yeah? to help other people. You understand? Yeah? So if it is based on the love of God, then there's no problem with it. But the simple love of dunya is one of the most corruptive, if not the most corruptive, 
and destructive loves that there is that would make me forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God says in the Quran in surah number 63, Verse number nine, Ya ayyuhalladhina amanu la tulhikum amwalukum wa la awladukum an dhikrillah. He says, O you who believe, let not your wealth or your children divert you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These gifts that I have given you of children, These gifts that I have given you of wealth should not prevent you from my remembrance. وَمَنْ يَفْعَلْ ذَلِكْ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ And whoever lets um, these things divert them from the remembrance of God, they are indeed the losers, God says. They are indeed the losers. You just look at these two examples that God has mentioned here of wealth and children. These two gifts that God has mentioned um, can either be used for good or they can be used for bad, can't it? These gifts can either bring me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or it can take me further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why God even describes in the Holy Quran when He says that your wealth and your children are fitna. They are a trial for you. Yeah, you're either going to pass with this trial or you're going to fail with this trial, depending on how you do, how you upbring them, how you raise them. Um, if you're willing to pay more attention to them than to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? There's this whole, it's very important. You know, we, I just gave a two-part series lecture at, at Masumin on the, the role of parents. And it's quite amazing, you know, when you look at the status of parents, it is after the, the uh, Allah, the Ahlul Bayt, the Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, then his parents. Yeah? They are in that totem pole of the ones who are absolutely close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when you try to ponder and reflect that why did God give them such a status? Because honestly, if you look at it today, it doesn't take much to be a parent. It yeah? doesn't take much to have a child today. Yeah? You look at all of the children who are born um, just because they want to have fun. Yeah? So it doesn't take much to have a child. But the fact that God has given so much honor to parents is because of the responsibility that has been given to parents. Yeah? Respo- the parents' responsibility after the Ahlul Bayt and the Prophet, yeah, or the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt is the parents. This is the fourth highest responsibility one has. So when you, if we think about this, this task that we have, it's a big that's why God says they are your tests. Yeah? Children are your tests to see how you do. The most important thing that we have to realize when we talk about hubbu dunya is that we can enjoy this world. There's no point. There's nothing like we can't enjoy this world. As long as that enjoyment gets me closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then yes, there's absolutely no problem with enjoying this world. But if that enjoyment um, is at the sake or at the, at the cost of sacrificing my relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then I have failed yeah, by going after these things. So this is a, a very important point to, to remember that don't ever use the bounties of God against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? You understand what I mean? Yeah? It's like you give me a knife. He says it's a very good knife and I stab you with that knife. Yeah? That's cruel. Yeah? That's cruel, right? Um, you say, I need a loan, so I give you a thousand dollar loan. Then you take that loan to create fitna for me. That's cruel. Yeah? That's not right. Imagine we do that with God all the time. Yeah? All the time. God gives us out of His grace. God gives us because He's nice. God gives us because He's merciful. Then we take that and then we forget about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? This is hubbud dunya. Yeah, this is what hubbu dunya does. So this is the first test that we have that will make us forget about God. This is that test that even sometimes keeps us in that first realm, isn't it? Yeah? Because of my love of wealth, my love of my business, I'll pray quick, quick, just to get it done so I can go back to my business. I'll do dhikr very fast so I can go back to my business. I will check my bank account on my phone while I'm taking out tasbih for the love of wealth. 
Yeah? So this is that first and probably the greatest, like I mentioned, obstacle that prevents us from moving higher in the chain of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second is very interesting. The second is Al-Alimu Maftunun Bid Dunya. Subhanallah. The second is a scholar who has been seduced by the world. Yeah? You know, we give a great deal of respect to scholars. Yeah? And we should. Yeah? Um, a scholar will be imitated. A scholar will be followed. Yeah? This is why you know, scholars have to be on guard at all times. Yeah? How they laugh, how they talk, how they eat. All of these things become a hujja for those who are watching them. Isn't it? Yeah? You all with me? Yes, Ahsantum. Yeah, I need I need to see the nodding of the head for me to move forward, yeah? Allahumma. I remember one of my teachers telling me, you know, he was a he was a sheikh who studied in Sham for many years and then went back to Tanzania uh, for uh, for a summer. And he said he came back and he said, you know, I went to one of these mosques in Tanzania. He's like, and I went there for salah. And there was Jamaat Salah going on. And I saw that one of the congregants who was praying, yeah, he was praying with one leg and the second leg was up. So he was standing on one foot like, uh, um, what's that animal? Flamingo, Ahsantum, yeah, like, the, like a flamingo. So he's like, what's going on here? Yeah, why is this guy praying with one leg up? So he went to ask him. He's like, hey, what's up? Why are you praying with one leg up? So he said, you know, yesterday I came to mosque and I saw the sheikh who was leading salah praying with one leg up. So I thought this must be a higher elevation to God. Yeah, <laughs> like you're taking a step to God. So he was like, he was surprised. He was like, wait a minute, how did that happen? Right? So he said, who was the sheikh? So he found out, so he went to the sheikh's house and he went there and he related the story. He said, subhanallah, I had sprained my ankle yesterday. I couldn't put weight on it. <laughs> yeah, um, people imitate scholars. Yeah? But we often forget that scholars are human beings. Yeah? There will be those who will be tempted by dunya. There will be those who will be tried by dunya. And when we look at our traditions, we find that the Ahlul Bayt السلام, who are the proofs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say that scholars who have been seduced by dunya will make you forget about the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? I'll read this hadith from our seventh Imam, Imam Musa al Kazim alayhi salam. Allah. Allah. Where he says, Ya Hisham, Awha Allahu ta'ala ila Dawood alayhi salam. So he says to Hisham, he says, Hisham, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed this to Dawood. So it is a hadith al Qudsi. He says, Qulli ibadi. لا تجعلوا بيني وبينهم عالما مفتونا بالدنيا. He says, "Tell my servants, O Dawood, not to keep between themselves and me scholars who are seduced by dunya. Yeah, don't let these scholars be the middle ground to get to me, O Dawood. Because why? فيصدهم عن ذكري وعن طريق محبتي ومناجاتي أولئك قطاع الطريق من عبادي. He says they will surely preclude or move my servants away from my remembrance. These scholars who are maftoon bid dunya and they will block the way to my remembrance and their supplication to me. Such scholars are the bandits of my servants. Yeah? These are the worst people, my servants. Um, bandits are who? People you should avoid, right? Like when you're on the street and you find, you know there's bandits there, you avoid those streets, right? He said these are the people who are like bandits. They will come and they will try to persuade them in each and every other way for their own gain. This gain is what? Material gain. It could be popularity. Sometimes people are chasing intellectual um, superiority. Yeah? It's, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah? It's unfortunately a dangerous world that we live in, but it's a sad reality that we can't escape. Yeah? We have to be very cautious who we view as scholars. You know, oftentimes, and I don't blame the public that much, sometimes I do, but they don't distinguish between a scholar and a zakir. Yeah? 
A zakir is a reciter of Aba Abdullah. He'll come, he'll make us cry, he serves a purpose and a lofty station he has. But we go to them and ask them for istifta. Yeah, what is the ruling on this? What is, they don't know. Yeah? It's not their job to know. In fact, it's our job to be able to distinguish between a reciter and a scholar. Yeah? So that we can control or we can go the right way. I think another very important um, benchmark that we should remember, and obviously I'm sitting here as one saying this, right? Um, so I see God's assistance and that I don't fall prey to this because it's, it's easy. You can understand why an individual um, will fall prey to the vices that are out there. Yeah? And you have to also remember, like we talked about in the very beginning, that it's not sinners who shaitan goes after. Yeah? They've, they've already won. Shaitan's already won after sinners. He goes after those who are religious. He goes after those who are pious. He goes after those who are learned to deceive them because that's where the work is, isn't it? Right? So you don't blame, or I don't blame people for falling prey to this. You, you realize this is part of life and we hope that we can bring them back. Right? But I think the, a, a really good... Um, Litmus test would be is that if I know that I myself am liberal, yeah, I like mixed gatherings, yeah, I'm not too big on keeping beard, yeah, I, I'm not too big on wearing hijab, yeah, I know I'm a liberal, yeah, and then I get a scholar and I'd be like, this guy's preaching to me, yeah, he's saying exactly, yeah, that's a problem, that's not a good thing, yeah. If you are a liberal and a non quote unquote religious person and you find a scholar who's talking exactly like you believe, that's an issue. Yeah? That's not something that you'd be like, oh, we have to bring this scholar in. No, that's a scholar we don't bring in. Yeah? That's a scholar we avoid. Okay? So that's a good litmus test for us to gauge our own selves and then try to see why I like this certain speaker or not. So this is the second test. The third is, and we'll end with this one insha'Allah. The third hurdle which will prevent me from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is persistent sinning. Yeah? Persistent sinning. There's a tradition we get from Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He says, Man sadi'a bil ism. Asha an dhikrillahi azza wa jal. One who is rusted or covered with sin is blinded from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah? When one who just sins, doesn't care about sinning anymore, it's become an everyday thing. Yeah? This is the way we start. Yeah? This, is the way I, this is the way when somebody sins for the first time, their conscience will bite at them, for sure. Yeah? Because we're created pure. But if we keep... Um, silencing and pushing down our conscience, um, eventually sinning will become a part of, part of life. It won't be a big deal for me to sin. And once our heart becomes rusted and we, are not, and we don't care that I am sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is God then who takes us the rest of the way and just covers our heart yeah, with rust. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, fi qulubihim maradun فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ marada. It says they have sickness in their heart. Yani they had sickness but they never cared to cure it. So I increased the sickness in their heart, God says. فَزَادَهُمُ اللَّهُ marada. Yeah? Until they were completely rusted. And when one gets to that stage of rust, they no longer remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is not something which is their objective. God is not something which they are drawn towards. Yeah? And this is unfortunately, when you look at these three hurdles, we find them present within the enemies of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam in Karbala. Yeah? You look at, for example, um, those um, who were tested or had fallen prey to the love of dunya. Yeah? You look at Umar ibn Sa'd. Yeah? He had been promised governorship of Ray, isn't it? The love of dunya was so much that it was okay for him to kill the grandson of the Prophet. Imagine. Yeah? Imagine the dangers of love of dunya. The hubbud dunya. And then of course you had people who were tainted scholars. You had people on the side of Ibn Ziyad 
who are memorizers of the Quran. Yeah? This is why, you know, when it's not a litmus test to see who's memorized the most Quran, who practices the Quran, who lives the Quran, who abides by the Quran. And of course you see then as well those who had this sinned and sinned so much that they didn't, their hearts were not even a little bit inclined to the call of Imam al Hussein when he said, Hal min nasiri yansuruna. Yeah? Is there not a helper to help me? Imagine, my brothers and sisters, even if our enemy said that to us, it would still ring a bell and awaken us and say, Wait a minute, this is a very pitiful state that I find him in. Yeah? But their hearts were so rusted yeah, that this call from the grandson of the Prophet had no effect on their heart whatsoever. Yeah? This is what we find on the side of Ubaidullah. This is what we find on the side of Umar ibn Sa'd. But on the other side, we find a complete different picture, don't we? Yeah? We find in the side of Aba Abdullah alayhi salam, the complete opposite. Where there was nothing that was stopping them from remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fear of death did not stop them from remembering God. The thirst of three days did not stop them from remembering God. The threats of looting did not threaten, did not remove them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And tonight we are remembering one such boy. Yeah? One such young man who historians tell us was no more than 13 years old on the day of Ashura. Yeah? It is said on the day, on the night of Ashura, on the 10th night, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam spoke to his companions and informed them that tomorrow when the battle starts, they are after me and they are not after you. I leave and I lift my allegiance from you with all the companions and all the family members gave their allegiance to Aba Abdullah alayhi salam. And then Imam al Hussein alayhi salam on that night said that it is guaranteed that tomorrow yeah, we will be martyred on the plains of Karbala when the companions again gave their allegiance to Imam al Hussein and they left. Imam al Hussein saw a young boy standing at the corner of the tent. <laughs> Imam al Hussein looks at him and Imam al Hussein says, Is there something that you want, Qasim? Qasim says to him, Yabna Rasulillah. <laughs> ya Amma wa ana fi man yuqtal. He says, Tell me, uncle, will I be amongst those who are shaheed tomorrow? <laughs> Imam al Hussein looks at him and he says, Ya Bunaya, Ya Bunaya, Kaifal Mauti Indak. He says, Oh, my son, how do you find death? What do you think about death? Qasim replies, Ya Amma, Fika Ahla min al Asal. He says, Death with you, Ya Bun Rasulillah, is sweeter for me than honey. Imam al Hussein. Hussein alayhi salam embraces Qasim. Ah, Imam al Hussein alayhi salam embraces Qasim and informs him that indeed tomorrow, my son, you will be shaheed on the plains of Karbala. It is said, my brothers and sisters, that Qasim was that shabih of Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. Every time Aba Abdullah wanted to see his brother Hassan, he would look at Qasim. For Qasim looked like Hassan. Qasim walked like Hassan. Qasim had the akhlaq of Imam al Hassan. It is said when Imam al Hassan was on his deathbed, Imam al Hussein came to see him. And when he saw him in that state where his skin had turned yellow from the poison, Imam al Hussein weeped and weeps and looking at his brother Hassan. Imam al Hassan says, Ya Aba Abdullah, Lima Tabchi. He says, Oh my brother, why do you cry? This is something which has already happened. The poison has taken through. But oh Hussein, La Yom Ki Yom Ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like your day, oh Aba Abdullah. It is a 
said Imam al Hussein gave the ghusl and kafan on his brother Hassan. As they carried the janazah of Hassan, the enemies began shooting arrows, shooting arrows at the dead body of Imam al Hassan. We say to our Imam, Wa Imama, Wa Madluma, look at what they are doing to your body, O oh Imam. But ah, ah, come to Karabobala. Here they have shot arrows at your lifeless body. There they will shoot arrows while Imam al Hussein is still alive. They will shoot arrows at the six month old Ali Yun al Asghar. Imam al Hassan alayhi salam gave three sons to Imam al Hussein for Karbala. There was Abdullah al Akbar, then there was Abdullah al Asghar, and then there was Qasim. Qasim's death is the one that pains the heart the most. It is said on the day of Ashura, Ibn Farwa sends Qasim and says, Qasim, go to your uncle and make sure that you fulfill the promise and the desire of your father Hassan Qasim comes to Imam al Hussein. He comes to Imam al Hussein and he says, Ya Amma, allow me to go. Imam al Hussein looks at Qasim. Tears begin to flow down his cheeks. He says, Qasim, every time I see you, it reminds me of my brother Hassan. I cannot allow you to go. Narrators say he comes back dejected to his mother. At that moment, Umme Farwa remembers a letter that was given to her. A letter that was given to her by Imam al Hassan. He said to her, Oh, Mefarwa, there will come a time, there will come a time when you will need some assistance. When you need this assistance, open this letter and use it. Oh, Mefarwa. <laughs> Umm Farwa gives this letter to Qasim and says, Qasim, take this to your uncle Hussein. Imam al Hussein, when he sees Qasim come again, we can imagine how his art must have been aching. Qasim comes and says, Oh, my uncle, this is a letter from my father for you. Ah, ah, how the name and the remembrance of his brother would have crippled the heart of Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein, it is said, took this letter, kisses the letter, places it on his eyes, and then he opens this letter. Tears begin to come down the cheeks of Imam al Hussein. How can he now refuse the last will and the last wish? of his brother Hassan Imam alayhi salam gives him permission it is said Hassan goes back his mother makes him wear the green amama of Imam al Hassan his mother makes him wear the armor of Imam al Hassan his mother gives him the sword of Imam al Hassan ah the narrators of Karbala report that when Qasim exited the tents, it was like we could see a whole moon coming towards us. A bright new moon walking towards us. And we stood in amazement that who is this shining young boy who is walking towards the battlefield? It is that Imam Qasim fought a valiant battle until a mal'oon by the name of Ibn Fudayl comes from behind Qasim. Qasim, wa wayla, ya ba Abdullah. He comes behind Qasim. He strikes Qasim on his head. Qasim falls from his horse. Qasim screams out, "Assalamu alaikum, ya ba Abdullah." Assalamu alayka ya amma. It is said Imam al Hussein rose from his tent the way a hawk rises. Imam al Hussein rushed towards the enemies. 
like a roaring lion, Ibn Fudayl screams out to his companions that Hussein is attacking me. Come to my assistance. When the enemies began to converge, the horses began to collide. Little did they know that the body of Qasim, <laughs> the body of Qasim was underneath the hooves of the horse. Mu'mineen, Mu'mineen, it is reported that whenever a family member fell, they called Imam al Hussein one time. But the pain of the horse made Qasim constantly call out for Imam al Hussein. Ya Amma, Ya Amma, Adrikni Ya Amma. It is said Imam al Hussein rushes towards Qasim and as the horses disperse, he finds Qasim's body in such a state that tears begin to roll down the cheeks of Imam. Imam al Hussein places his cheek on the cheek of Qasim. He says, Oh my son, forgive me. You called your uncle, but your uncle was not quick enough to go. You called your uncle and when he came it was too late for your uncle to assist you. It is said that Imam al Hussein carried the body of Qasim. He took him to the tent of Shuhada. He placed him near Ali ibn al Akbar. Historians say he sat in the middle, put his hand on both their chests and wept the way he had not wept on that day. Mata me Hussein.